uh, last week, uh, we, we talked about the place of the vine, right? Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. We talked about the place of the vine, that when we abide in Jesus, it is in that place that we bear much fruit, that you become what you want to become. You become what you want to become by being in, in, you know, lingering in the presence of Jesus, of the vine. This week, I want to talk about the place of thunder, right? The secret place of thunder. And it's the same place as last week. It's just a different picture. And we're going to talk about this more next week in Revelation. But, but the Bible gives us imagery in order to stir our emotions. It's just talking about the same thing over and over and over. But, but a picture, it wrenches hold of our hearts. It grabs a hold of us uh, in, a, in a new and fresh way. And so this picture, this secret place of thunder, that's what I want to talk about. And it's the secret place of thunder. It's the place where you meet God in the wilderness. Uh, Psalm 81, it's a song. Uh, when we read the Psalms, we have to kind of remember, like, th- this is a song. It's meant to be sung, and it was a song that, uh, uh, it's a song about life in the wilderness. It's a melody they would sing. Uh, God's people in the Old Testament, they would sing it during the Feast of Tabernacles. It was a feast that God's people observed once a year, and it was meant to remind them of their wilderness moments and what God did, because we have a tendency to forget uh, what God did in the past, and we're not sure if he's going to do it again uh, this year, right? And so they, they would sing this song, and it was meant to remind them of the Exodus, when God delivered his people out of slavery in Egypt. God had brought them out of bondage uh, in Egypt. They had, he had brought them out of bondage to their circumstances, but then they quickly realized that they were still imprisoned. No longer were they slaves in Egypt. Now they find that they're still a slave to themselves. If you know the story, I mean, you know some of what happened. Like, there, there, it was right after, like, this one time God... I delivered them from Egypt, right? They just got out, uh, and the Egyptians handed them all their gold and jewelry and was like, just get out, right? Just go. And so they, they plunder all of the riches of Egypt, and, and God's, God's, God's presence in the, is in the cloud by day. His presence is in, in the pillar of fire by night. You have this epic moment. Like, talk about a spiritual high. And, and they're, they're, they're walking in the wilderness, and they come up to the Red Sea, and they can't get past And they turn behind them and they see the Egyptian army coming after them. God had just done all this miraculous stuff. And they say, let us go back. For it would be better to be slaves in Egypt than to die in the wilderness. And God in his grace speaks through Moses this famous verse. He says, don't fear. The Lord will fight for you. You only have to be what? Silent. And then later, so God does the, 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 you know, the Red Sea thing. Later, they start complaining about being hungry, right? So they're like, we would rather be slaves in Egypt where we sat next to piles of meats and we're full of bread than to die hungry in the wilderness. And so God in his grace, he, he rains down manna from heaven, like honey bread from, hand, uh, from, from, from heaven, full of gluten and everything, right? Just, you know, pfft you know, rains down bread. And then they get tired of that. And now they want some meat. I mean, who didn't want some meat? And so, so they start complaining and he starts raining quail down from heaven. Bacon wrapped, maybe it wasn't bacon wrapped because that's not kosher, but <laughs> birds just started falling out of the, the sky and they're eating meat to the full. And then they start complaining uh, again because now they're thirsty. And so God in his grace, he has, he has uh, 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 Moses strike the rock and fresh spring water comes out of the, the rock. And, and then last one, while Moses was on the mountain, mountain meeting with God, so he's on the mountain meeting with God. God's going to hand him the Ten Commandments. And, and they're down on the mountain, the bottom of the mountain. They start getting a little antsy and angsty. And they start, their trust in God begins to wane. And you know what they did? They took all the gold and all the jewelry from Egypt that they had plundered. And they melt it down. And they fashion it into a golden calf. And they begin to worship this calf. And they say, this God is what delivered us out of Egypt. God does these things and delivers them out of slavery and and all of that. They were no longer slaves in Egypt, but they realized they were still enslaved to themselves. And so God uses the wilderness to draw his people back to himself. He uses the wilderness to show them that they're still enslaved to themselves, not their circumstances, and that it's in him that there is freedom and joy. And so Psalm 81, it's about life in the wilderness, The wilderness, it's when you're thirsty and there's nothing to wet your lips. It's when you're hungry and there's nothing around to fill you. It's when you're lonely and there doesn't seem to be anyone around. It's when you're scared and anxious and vulnerable because you're without shelter. That's the wilderness. The wilderness can't support human life. You can't get what you need there. But, but 
in the wilderness, if you would go, there is a place that you can find life and freedom and joy, and that place is the secret place of thunder. The secret place of thunder. And so in verse six, God begins to sing, and he says, I relieved your shoulder of the burden. Your hands were freed from the basket. I have set you free from slavery. In distress you called, and I delivered you. And here's our verse. And I answered you in the secret place of thunder. Now he's referring to the meeting that God had with his people at Mount Sinai. I'll show it to you. Exodus 19. Uh, It says this. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. A million people, they were gonna meet with God. Verse 17. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire and the smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. Thunder is the thunder of God's voice. It's God's word. And it always comes in the presence and power of God. And so this imagery of thunder, it's used all throughout the Bible for God's voice. Psalm 29, the voice of the Lord is over the waters and the God of glory thunders. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. Thunder, it's the word of God and the presence and power of God. And then the secret place of thunder, that word secret there means something. Uh, it, it, it means covering, it means hiding. Uh, it's the same word that's used in Psalm 27, five, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in the secret of his tabernacle. Or Psalm 32, seven, you are my hiding place, same word. Uh, it's found in Psalm 91. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And so the secret place of thunder, it's the place of meeting. It's the place of transformation. It's the place that you go to meet with God. It is the meeting with God. That is the secret place of thunder. Uh, one, of the, one of the ways, if you've been around here long, you, you know, I mean, any amount of time, really, one of the ways we talk about discipleship here at the church, what it means for us to follow Jesus, what we're trying to equip you in and call you to, uh, one of the big ways in which we talk about that is through spiritual rhythms and habits, where we regularly go to the secret place of thunder. It's your room, it's your prayer closet, it's some space in your house, it's probably early in the morning or late at night when everything is kind of calmed down, quieted down, and your soul has slowed down, and you meet with God through prayer and and silence and through his word, the Bible. Uh, The Israelites, they trembled at the mountain, and they needed Moses to speak for them. But, but in the New Testament, we're, we're different. Like the book of Hebrews says that because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that you and I, we can approach the throne of grace with boldness. That wherever we are and wherever we go, we can go to the secret place of thunder and meet with God. Do you have that regular rhythm? Or do you do that? Do you have a secret place where you can hear the thundering of God's voice? Do you have a place in your house? a time of day that you go to, like that is your place and you're gonna go meet with God on the mountain. It might not be every day. Uh, This isn't trying to earn God's favor. We're not talking about you have to do this in order for God to love you or bless you or anything like that. That's not what we're talking about. What we're saying is that life is a wilderness and the place to go in the wilderness is the place of thunder. Do you go? Do you go? Uh, Barner Research, those are the guys that do the the studies on the church uh, on us, right? They're like, here's what Christian folk are like. And, and you know, you're gonna get stats, like there's no hiding, right? Numbers don't lie. And so they, they, they did this study on what they called resilient disciples. So th- kind of the way they defined that was like Christians that were radically committed to their faith, uh, despite the fact that it's becoming more and more unpopular for us to be a Christian, these are Christians that are radically committed to their faith. They call them resilient disciples. And the number one practice that they found resilient disciples do is they go to the secret place of thunder. That they have a private devotion, a regular habit, a regular rhythm of getting before the Lord, communing with God. Jesus did this, by the way. 
Right? Jesus, would, he had these habits of resistance that helped him be resilient to the trials and temptations that he faced. Uh, over and over again, if you read the Gospels, the four biographies of Jesus, you'll see over and over and over Jesus doing this. So uh, Mark 1, verse 35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. That's the secret place of thunder. Uh, uh, Luke 5, 16, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Luke 6, 12, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Matthew 14, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. John 6, 15, jo Jesus, knowing that they intended to come out and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. His fame and influence is rising. And what does he do? He gets away to a quiet place, the secret place of thunder. The, listen to this. The secret place of thunder is the one place you don't have to perform. You don't have to impress because Jesus doesn't need anything from you. The secret place of thunder, it's the one place that you're truly known. He knows you. He knows what's happening in those corners of your heart you can't even see because with Jesus, you don't have to explain yourself. The secret place of thunder, it's the one place where you can be completely honest. Jesus doesn't need your filter. At the secret place of thunder, it's a hiding place. It's a safe place. It's the place you go when you're in the wilderness. But, but it is also the secret place of thunder, meaning it's the secret place of God's word. God speaks there, which means you're not gonna be able to leave the secret place of thunder and go do whatever you want. See, there's an alternate to the secret place of thunder. There's an alternate to getting regularly with God. You can do something else. It's not better, but you can do it. Like, look at verse 8 again. In verse 8, God says, let me hear what, wait, where am I? I just jumped to a different chapter. I'm sorry. He says, hear, O my people, while I admonish you. O Israel, if you would but listen to me. There shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign God. I am the Lord, am your God. I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Verse 11, but my people did not listen to my voice and would not submit to me. Right, he's saying in verse nine, don't have any idols. Don't trust other things. Don't trust other gods. An idol was just an, a, a, an image representation of a God, right? a false God. Uh, it was this uh, temple statue, or it was something that they formed or fashioned, and it represented the, the, this invisible false god that they were the god of the harvest, the god of fertility, whatever it was. They were worshiping some false god, and they would make an image of that god, and they would worship that god, and trust that god, and pray to that god, and sacrifice to that god in hopes of appeasing that god in some way so that that god would give them what they want. Right? Make it rain, uh, you know, do this, give us a great harvest, uh, and, and we're going to try to appease this God, which is why like, we talk about money being an idol for us in our day. Uh, money's an idol. It's not that we think money is a God, but it represents what we think is ultimate. It represents something we, we greatly desire. It represents something that can set us free or save us in some sort of way. It could be sexual fulfillment. It could be things and stuff. It could be certain relationships, addictions, habits. Anything can be an escape for us, something that would numb us in the wilderness, Right, something that when we're thirsty, we go looking for it to quench. When we're hungry, we go looking for it to fill us up, which is what happened to God's people in the Old Testament. Verse 11 again. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. Verse 12. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. If verse 12 is not an indictment, on the idol of our age, I don't know what is. But if you're like idols, that seems archaic. This seems Old Testament. That's weird. What are you talking about? This is the idol of our age, verse 12. Right? The number one idol at the top of the worship charts in our day is the self. I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels, to follow their own heart. Mark Sayers, he says this, what we are experiencing in our day is not the eradication of God from the Western mind, but rather the enthroning of the self as the greatest authority. It's not that we leave God behind and no longer believe, it's just that ourselves have now trumped God. 
where we have elevated ourselves as the highest authority. What we say matters. What, who we are is what's most important. It's the idol of self in our day that we tend to run to as opposed to the secret place of thunder. We turn to us and not him. And so I, <laughs> I was thinking about this this week and just got a little bit big brother fierce on, 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 on you. Um, I will go to my grave to protect you of this. If our culture stays on the path that it's on for the next 30 years, I will spend the next three decades preaching against it over and over. I will beat that drum until you are tired of hearing it. And it's this, it is the sin of self-discovery. If you don't go to the secret place of thunder, if you won't commune with Jesus, if that's not a regular thing for you, you will find yourselves imprisoned in the counsel of your own heart. You're gonna be looking for yourself and looking for yourself and trying to find yourself in the middle of all of your anxieties and trauma and sin and experiences and desires and lies and it will be exhausting. In your quest to discover your true self, you will go from idol to idol, hoping someone, something will have the key to unlock the secret of who you are. You will listen to various voices. Some of them will be soothing. Some of them will be, will be flattering. Some of them will be sweet, and they will overpromise and underdeliver. And some of them will be condemning, and some of them will accuse and berate. They will be like arrows to your soul that aren't removed very easily, and they're going to be even harder for you to not believe. You will try to forgive yourself, whatever that means. You will try to love yourself whatever that means, you will try to set yourself free and it will not work. It will not work. Jesus said to find yourself, you have to lose yourself. If you really want to live, if you want to be free, you have to die to yourself. And it won't work. It won't work because you were made for so much more than self-discovery and self-fulfillment. You were made for him. Like you have so much more value than you could find within yourself. You need him to tell you that if we keep looking for ourselves and exalting ourselves and putting ourself in the, on the throne of our heart, you'll, you'll never actually find yourself. This is why the secret place of thunder is so important. It's so important to, to get with God. You want to know who you are. You, gotta go, you, gotta, you, gotta, you can't look at yourself. You have to look at him. And we can't expect to get enough Jesus out of a sermon once a week or a couple of times a month. We can't live in the hamster wheel of our minds 24-7 and then try to hop off and rest in Jesus for one hour on a Sunday and think that's enough. We can't wake up with our phones, cuddle them all day, imbibing all of their you know, information and entertainment, have our phones put us to bed and think that just a little bit of Jesus is going to do. We need a regular rhythm of going to the secret place of thunder so that we will be filled. We are only satisfied in him. Verse 16 again, what a verse. And with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. Like he, he will fill you up. Have you ever no noticed like how over the top God is? You read the Bible and, and you just, he's redundantly extravagant, God. Right? Everything he does is over, over the top. There's not just some stars, there are hundreds of billions of stars. Right? Not just a few, hundreds of billions of galaxies of hundreds of billions of billions of stars. We don't just have one flower. We have 400,000 different species of flower and 500 different colors of those flowers. We don't just get one sunset every once in a while. We get it every day, every night. We get it every, every we get it. <laughs> Everything God does is to the fullest. Right, the promised land, it is overflowing with milk and honey. Jesus says, my joy will be in you and your joy will be what? Full. I came to give you life, he says, and life what? Abundantly. Old pastor John Preston, he said this, there is scarcely any action which Christ ever did, but you shall find a fullness in it. At the first miracle he ever worked, he filled six enormous water pots with wine. Afterwards, he filled 5,000 guests from five loaves and two fish. Likewise, he filled the disciples' nets with so many fish they were ready to burst. He filled his disciples with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, which is the best fullness of all. With honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He will fill you up. He will satisfy. If, if, we would listen. Verse eight, again, if you would but listen to me. Verse 11 again, but my people would not listen 
to my voice. But then verse 13, an invitation to listen again, hear it. Oh, that my people would listen to me. I, I, th- I think sometimes we read the Bible and we, like when God is admonishing us or correcting us, or we just kind of feel like that conviction, right? We feel that kind of conviction. And I don't know, I don't know if it's bad teaching, I don't know if it's just the, the proclivity of the human heart, but we tend to, that, tend to get, that tends to get highlighted in our heart more than the invitation. This is an invitation again. Right, God's saying, you've turned away from me. You haven't come to me. You won't draw near to me. You'll go to other things. You trust other things. You won't listen to me. Oh, but my, would my people listen to me again? This is the invitation of God's grace that goes out to us all again. In 2023, will you come to me? Will you slow down and spend time with me? Will you stop trying to figure this thing out? Would you stop trying to work this thing out? Some of us, our wilderness is just working towards, right, this performance idol of one day I will be enough. What does Jesus say? He says, no, 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 come to me. Come to me, come to me, all who are heavy laden. Come to me, all who are weary, come to me. See, here's the thing about Jesus that, like, he's not like other people, and he's not like other gods. The other gods, they, they need, you have to worship them to appease them and sacrifice for them and do things for them so that one day, hopefully, they will be pleased with you enough and you'll get some rain. Jesus isn't like that. Jesus isn't like the other people that you know. As long as you perform, they like you. As long as you look good, they like you. As long as you're in style, they like you. As long as you're popular, they like you. As long as you produce, they like you. As long as you're, you're, you know, you're their people, they like you. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus is different. He says, don't come to me performing. Don't come to me perfect. Come to me all who are heavy laden. Come to me all who are broken. Come to me with your sin all messed up. That's how I want you to come. The secret place of thunder, it's the one place you don't have to perform, the one place you're truly known, the one place that you can be completely honest. Will you listen to him? Will you listen to the invitation to come to him? I'll give you one more verse and then I want to tell you a story. 1 Corinthians 10, 4. The Apostle Paul, he writes in the New Testament, he says, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Pastor Paul, he's writing to a church, a local church in the city of Corinth, and he takes this story of God's people in the wilderness and he, and he applies it to them. And he says, hey, that rock that they drank from, that rock of honey, that rock of living water, that rock that quenched their thirst, that rock was Jesus. Y'all, there's no one like Jesus. Would you spend a month with Jesus? in the secret place of thunder? Like, would you start the year off, would you just say, I'm gonna commit to a month of not just, you know, yeah, I followed you, getting with the Lord. Would you get up 30 minutes earlier than maybe you normally do or uh, watch 30 minutes less of TV at night and do, like, do the Paradox 365 reading. We've got a reading plan. We've got journals in the lobby. Uh, go, go, Go buy the journals. Go take the journals. If you don't have money, just take the journals. Okay, take them. Nobody's gonna, you you just, if you have a lot of money, pay for more journals. Okay, just take the journals. Take the journals, read the Bible, get with the Lord, get into the secret place, spend 30 minutes, spend a month sitting in quiet, praying the Psalms, crying out to Jesus. Do it for a month and see what happens. Do it for a year and see your life transformed. Will you accept the invitation to commune with God to get to the secret place of thunder because it's a secret place of thunder that you go to when you're in the wilderness. Uh, a guy named Ignatius of Loyola, he, he was the founder, he started the, the Jesuit um, uh, movement. And, and I loved like reading about 
kind of how God called him into that and, and the, the time of preparation uh, before he, he began this unbelievable movement of God that's gone on for hundreds of years. Uh, he was born in a time very similar to ours. It was a time of chaos and social kind of change and turmoil. Uh, there, there was a lot of polarization and just a lot of things going on in the world. And after his conversion, he still didn't really know. Like he, was, he still felt a little lost. Uh, he didn't know what, what God was calling him to. He didn't know what it looked like to now follow this Jesus guy and, 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 and all that he'd been shaped by up until that point. He didn't know what it meant to leave behind some things or how to view the world. And, and so he was kind of wandering about. And his wanderings would land him in a small Spanish town called Menresa. And, and he, he, only, he only thought he'd be there like a few days. I think he was visiting somebody or he was just, uh, he was heading through. But he ended up staying there for one year. For one year. And he found this cave in this small town, and for a year, he would regularly go visit this cave, and he would go to his secret place of thunder. He would meet with God in this cave. For a year, he would go, and, and God began to break him down and then build him back up. And, and one of his biographers said uh, it, it, he came to a clear insight into his sin, but at the same time began to appreciate himself as a uniquely dignified and gifted person because you don't find yourself by finding yourself, you find yourself by losing yourself. And so this insight came from deeper intimacy with God. He would read through prayerfully the biographies of Jesus multiple times, specifically meditating on Jesus' uh, death for him on the cross. And so he came out of that year with a profound knowledge of God's immense love for him. He went into the cave knowing that God loved him, but he came out of the cave experiencing God's love. And it changed him. Right, we can listen to a sermon and know about God's love, but it takes the secret place of thunder to experience it. And so he comes out of this one year in this town and in this cave, and he founds this movement that would serve and minister all over the world to this day, but it started because he spent a year in the secret place of thunder. You might not have a cave to pray in, but tomorrow you can wake up 30 minutes early, sit in a chair, watch the sun rise, and go to that secret place. You maybe don't feel like you're in the wilderness right now, but whatever you have going for you, Jesus is better, and at some point this year, something's going to make you thirsty, and you're gonna get really hungry, and you're gonna feel like you're in the wilderness, and it's the secret place, the only place to go in the wilderness. What might God do in you if after a year you spent in a cave with Jesus? This year doesn't have to be like last year. One of the lies you could believe would be to think that you're always going to be this way, you're always going to think these ways, you're always going to, uh, uh, you're always going to fall into these depressions, and, and this is the, the rhythm of your life, and you're still going to struggle with these habits and addictions, and you're still going to have this kind of mindset, and you're always going to be struggling with doubt, and, and we're going to, we're going to, we believe the lie that what happened last year has to happen this year. What if it doesn't? What if he wants to set you free? What if there's some things he wants to show of yourself? What if he's gonna do some change in you? What if there's some water that you need to drink so that you're not thirsty anymore and you just didn't realize that you've been drinking, I don't know, Sprite. Topo, like they say Topo quenches your thirst. It doesn't. I love it, but it doesn't. A year in the cave. Try for a month. Try for a month. See what happens. Know that you're going to go in there, man. Your head is going to be spinning. Your mind will go blank. The enemy will be lying. It, your kids will wake up earlier than they normally do. Amen? What if you spent a month, a year, committed to Jesus, spending time with Jesus, what he might do? Will you listen to him? Hear him invite you again. Come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. Let's try it right now. Posture yourself before the Lord and whatever that looks like for you. A lot of freedom here. You can be on your knees, you can stand up, you can stay sitting, you can put your hands out or up, close your eyes, open them. You can come up here to the front if you want. The 
Silence is so awkward in our day. There's so much noise. But the scriptures testify, and my experience has been that God tends to speak in the quiet. And so, Father, you are the the God of all blessings. By faith in the Son, we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We can approach the throne of your grace with boldness, and so we come boldly. Father, would you speak to our hearts as we attempt and seek and desire at some degree to consecrate, dedicate our life this year unto you? We know that there are certain sins, certain things, certain just way about us. There's parts of our story that feel like a hindrance. They feel like a Red Sea moment. And so God, would you speak truth to your people? Would you speak to them about that thing that they think about when they think about this year, when they, when they think about being free, when they think about more of you, it's that thing that hinders them or keeps them from believing or seeing that you might do a different thing, a new thing this year. Would you speak to the hearts of your people? We listen. He says, open your mouth and I will fill it with honey from the rock I will satisfy. Okay, you, can, you can respond to him now. You can speak to him now. It might just be an honest prayer again. God, I don't... I don't know if I believe you. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if this can happen. I don't know what this will look like. Or yes, Lord, but will you help me? Father, we thank you that you desire to meet with your children, that you invite us again. Would your truth, would your word, would it be the food for our soul this month, this year? Would we feast on what is true and right and good? Would you, would you disproportionately, uh, not, not for any, any reason, because we're, we're great or good or obedient or anything, nothing about us, but would you just, for at least a month, God, would you meet with the Paradox Church people as they, as they sit before you in their homes, their apartments, wherever, would you meet with us in just a profound and sweet way? I know it's not always like that, but would you do it? Jesus, you're not like the other gods. You're not like the other people. We don't have to perform for you. You delight. You, um, Isaiah 30, God waits to be gracious to us. You can't wait. You're waiting to bless us, God. And so we turn to you. 
We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.